welcome to our um, monthly Chamber of Commerce Lunch and Learn. If you could stand, please, and we'll have our Pledge of Allegiance to begin our event today. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, well thank you everybody for being here today. I'm Tuli Keanu, the director of the Lake County Chamber of Commerce. This is Cindy Esplin, my office manager and official event coordinator. Um, we'd like to welcome today Danae Sims Bauer and Tammy Sims from Bloomers Nursery. And they have a wonderful presentation today for us on gardening tips and um, we'll let them take it away. We'll do our thing. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for asking us, first of all. Um, Danae hasn't gotten to go out on the lecture circuit this spring, but I've been out doing a few of them, so thank you very much for uh, coming and listening to what we, some of the ideas that we have about uh, gardening. And um, I'm going to let Danae start off with uh, talking about some of the new varieties. So, um, we have a lot of new varieties. My sister Darcy, who we gave a break today from being out um, talking, she would rather be working among the plants. Um, she's the one that orders a lot of our new varieties as far as the annuals. We all kind of have our specialties. She does the annuals. I typically do the perennials. And some of the new annuals we had were so popular, we actually, unfortunately, are just about at the tail end of those particular varieties, although we have lots of beautiful things still in the greenhouse. Um, one of the real workhorses for annuals are the Million Bells or Super Bells. Um, you'll, they're brand names. They're a caliber Coa is their um, general name that encompasses all of them. And this year uh, we had a double um, apricot. Yeah, this is a double apricot with a little red throat. And so that was one of the new varieties we had this year. They work great in hanging baskets. They work nice in containers. They mound and hold their form really well. Um, probably one of the most popular ones we had was Holy Moly. And this might be the last one I was able to find. It was a little popular. Yeah. And so it has the yellow and the pink with a little bit of um, flecking through the bloom. Um, Oh, that was uh, new purple. Evening Star, so a new purple has a, the center part is called the throat, has a yellow throat with a little deeper purple, and that's been really popular this year also. I feel like down white right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also have some osteos. Um, which are some really bright daisies. You can get a lot of longevity out of those. They go into the fall. Um, one of these is a double, and then the other is sunset, and it actually kind of starts a different, a little bit different shade, and kind of changes as it it's matures. Are those perennials? They are not. These oh, are all the annuals. Okay. Um, and so the, the annuals, one thing I like to do with my annuals to get a lot of longevity from them is I will start with some early spring planters and really use pansies and things that will tolerate the cold. And um, I, I'm even brave enough to try and clear back in March. And it does require doing some covering. Um, but your pansies can take a lot of cold. And then as summer hits and the heat, um, comes out, they, they aren't quite as happy, so I like to shear them back, cut them down close, um, move them into the shade, and then as kind of the end of summer and fall comes on, they start to be happy again, um, and then use them in some fall containers and add mums and grasses and, and really get a lot of longevity out of them. And then I'll pop them into a permanent bed, and sometimes they will winter over to the spring. So with your pansies, you can really get a long season. The osteos definitely won't winter over, but they are kind of the same way. You can start out fairly early with them and continue into the fall, kind of trading out some different pieces. We also have a, a portulaca, a, a newer one we've had the last couple of years. It's a little different than kind of what you think of as the portulaca with the tinier little... Um, succulent leaves. This one will trail out um, and there's three different colors that we've carried this year. A red, a pink, and a yellow. And 
If you're worried that maybe you're not going to get to water as regularly as you would like, the Portulaca is a nice um, annual for you. So there, there's different annuals that have different water requirements, and depending on your time schedule and how much water you, water you want to do, we can kind of help you out with that. So those were some new varieties. We had a few new petunias, but they were gone very quickly. One was called Starry Night. Night Sky. Night Sky. Mm -hmm. Dark purple, and each bloom was different. It had, it looked like someone had taken a paintbrush and kind of splattered paint all over it. Mm -hmm. And every single bloom was different. Um, we're hoping maybe this summer to be able to go to the field trials up around Woodburn and see some of the new varieties that are going to be coming out with for 2017. So we always like to try some new, new varieties. One thing Darcy and I have kind of, uh, many of you probably have heard the terms uh, spiller, thriller, and filler, which have been the big, the big uh, code words really that Proven Winners really promotes on making containers and even hanging baskets. And uh, this winter Darcy and I started uh, doing a little bit of breeding and uh, we kind of have taken up a new theory on planting and it's really just plant what you love when you come in the greenhouse or you're walking around if something, if something calls to you plant it and love it for that season because we get a lot of customers who are very caught up in matching annuals to the trim color of their house or this or that or the other and you know annuals are you know a four month um, indulgence I would say and so I just, you know, I'm just really trying to encourage customers, if you see something that you like, and even if it isn't really maybe in your color field, but you just are drawn to it for this season, plant it and, and give it a try. It might be something that you like. Um, so time to plant. This is a great time to be planting vegetables. So while I am a little bit more experimental with starting some of my annuals earlier and be willing to cover them, Vegetables definitely like it hot. They like it warm. They need a lot of sun. They won't handle the cold. Tomatoes, peppers are very tropical plants. And so now is actually a great time to be getting those into the ground. Um, some years we have people, they're very anxious to get gardening with their vegetables. And we will see them sometimes three or four times <laughs> replanting. Um, but now is typically a great time to get things like tomatoes and peppers in the ground. You could do some earlier season vegetables like lettuce and spinach um, when it was cooler, carrots. But now is really kind of the main season for our vegetables for here. Um, we've also brought some different uh, perennials with us, and perennials really is uh, where my heart is. I like to do some containers with the annuals, but I like the challenge, I guess, of perennials because we do have hard winters um, and difficult growing conditions, and so I like the challenge of the perennials and seeing them wake up and come to life in the spring. And um, they. They take some maintenance, but once you have a perennial bed, you get, a, I guess, a little bit more enjoyment with less work, maybe, with all the deadheading and things like that that the annuals require. So two kind of staple perennials that we recommend to people, um, whether they're just starting out gardening or they've been gardening a long time, is the daylily. And these are um, a sun lover. This one is the Stella de Oro, which is probably the most common popular daylily. It will rebloom most of the summer, and it stays a little smaller and more compact. A lot of people think of daylilies as the old-fashioned, taller orange daylilies, and they bloom once, and then you just have the grass. And there are so many daylily varieties right now that it's really hard for me to choose when I'm doing our order in the spring. There's um, you know, probably at least 50 varieties that our wholesaler grows in all different shades. Many of them are reblooming, some are fragrant, different sizes. But the daylily is really one that if you're, um, if you've been gardening a long time, you can get a lot of enjoyment. And if you're just starting out gardening, it's kind of a fail-proof perennial. And then if you have a shady area, um, unfortunately you are a little more limited with color and um, are going to have to focus on different textures and foliage and the hosta is going to be kind of your backbone to a shade garden. 
They fool people sometimes because they die back all the way to the ground, underground for the winter, and so a lot of people will say, oh, my hostas didn't make it. They take a little while to come up in the spring, but they can generally handle our um, tough climate here. Um, so those are a few of kind of our staple perennials. Um, a lot of people with some of the water restrictions in different areas and concern of drought are trying to go to a lower um, water usage garden, and so succulents have become extremely popular. This is a hen and chick. We also carry um, different sedums, and um, people do all kinds of fun things with them, putting them in their landscape, finding old farm implements to plant them in. They don't need as much root space as some of these other perennials do, and uh, we see a lot of really creative ideas with the succulents. One thing I, I would like to kind of back up and touch base on, today I mentioned uh, the deadheading, and uh, one thing about um, the proven winners and also, well mainly there's some other branded varieties as well that we do carry, but many of these uh, million bells and also the trailing petunias, they are self-cleaning, which means you really don't have to deadhead them anymore. They are not a fertile petunia, but a wave, a wave is a fertile petunia, and most of your upright petunias are a fertile petunia. And so what happens is for them to continue to bloom, you've got to take that spent bloom away. These are not, and so they will, you know, if you have a hanging basket, you might notice that you sometimes you just kind of shake it and it'll drop. That's what these are, this is what the term self-cleaning really means. And you don't have to deadhead these in order for them to continue to bloom and be beautiful all season. But on that note, we're going to talk a little bit about some fertilizer issues and keeping your hanging baskets and your annuals going nicely for the summer. Um, you know, one thing that you want to really be careful of and be certain that you're doing with a hanging basket is fertilizing it very often. Because what happens is, is that basket area has become consumed with roots. And so there's no soil really, it's, it's kind of evolved all that soil into a root mass. And there's not a lot of nutrition left in there. Many of you probably have noticed if you bought a hanging basket from us that sometimes you will notice little green pebble pieces of fertilizer in there. And that is a long-term um, sustainable type fertilizer that we use in the baskets. But because baskets are so demanding on their fertilizer requirements, you will also need to use uh, some variety of a water-soluble Fertilizer. This one uh, that Danae brought today is a really excellent one that we carry. It's a proven winner's fertilizer. Super easy to use. There's a little measuring spoon in here. You just use the measuring spoon to a gallon of water. Very similar to miracle Grow or other um, national brands. But this one is pretty close to a professional grade and it does a really good job. There's also uh, miracle Grow puts out a really good fertilizer, I think, as well. That's called um, Bloom Boost and it's very high in nutrient value. So, you know, on your annuals, you're asking them to continue to bloom, to be beautiful for a certain amount of time, and their requirements are fairly high. Whereas you get to some of these um, perennials, and they're gonna be more of an annual fertilizer type need. They don't need to be fertilized quite as often. But maybe you wanna go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, fertilizing on the roses. So um, for the roses, um, I like to start out the season um, using this bear product. It's an all-in-one, so you get uh, fertilization, but you also get some disease and insect control as well. And um, I think it's about an ounce, I'd have to look at the directions again, an ounce to two ounces uh, per gallon. You can get about three roses probably per gallon. You just water right around the base. Um, so I do that after kind of the real threat of a lot of freezes happens because I don't want to stimulate a lot of new growth on my roses in the early spring and then have that freeze. It's really hard because we always get that warm um, stretch, you know, sometime maybe in March and you want to get out and work in your beds and you're tempted to cut back your roses and pull the mulch away and I really have to fight that urge with the roses kind of just let them be a little longer. So I wait till, um, you know, it's a little bit more moderate in our temperatures and fertilize them with this product. And then I usually will do this again mid-summer. 
so about two times per season. Um, and that helps with the disease um, as well and the insects and roses. Um, are really susceptible to aphids in particular, and so this product helps. Sometimes I will have to spot hit my roses though also with a spray, so you can usually see the aphids will congregate mm -hmm. at the buds and kind of the stems just below um, the buds, that's usually where you'll find them. Um, and then if you want to really promote as much bloom as you can, I also um, don't hesitate to do um, a water soluble every couple weeks. Um, we just have such a shorter season here that you really can't, with these products, over-fertilize them. Um, if you're just doing it around the base, keeping it off their leaves, will really help promote uh, the bloom. The other thing, oh, I was just going to say one thing. We do recommend, though, on the roses that you discontinue your mm -hmm. fertilization about mid-September should be your last time because you're wanting them at that point to start to go dormant. You don't want to be encouraging new growth at that point. So letting them start slipping into their resting pattern is best if you stop in September. Um, with your perennials, which can include your roses as well, um, they don't really have a high feeding requirement like other plants. So if you hit them um, once, maybe twice, you know, depending on what your soil is, um, with this is a granular it's not as much of a, a slow release as these little pebbles are that are coated they're coated in a polymer and someone much smarter than me scientifically decides how fast it releases all the nutrients um, over the course of time this is just a straight granular you can mix it into like a tea they call it kind of let it set and soak and pour that around the base or you can just mix this right into your garden and I like to do that once um, a season with my perennials, gives them a little bit of a boost, but they don't need as much as the annuals do. The nice thing about that product, the Dr. Earth products, uh, we carry a lot of Dr. Earth, and the nice thing about it is it does have the mycorrhizae in it, and maybe some of you have heard of mycorrhizae, but it really is a fungus um, that is inside of this fertilizer that promotes root growth. Not all funguses are bad, and so this one is a real nice, um, I guess maybe you would call it's it like something. A probiotic. Yeah, it's like a probiotic for plants inside of that, and so it really does a great job helping your, just helping those uh, perennials just have a little bit better season, I think. And there are products, you know, lots of people are busy or maybe don't um, have the ability to be lugging around a watering can. Um, there's lots of products. miracle Grow probably does the best job with convenience products. This was a new one they came out with last year. It's called a universal feeder. You connect, um, there's a little device in the back here. You connect that right to your faucet, and then your hose connects to it, and you just insert this little um, jar of fertilizer, and it calculates out and feeds every time you water. And so as soon as this um, is used up, you just buy a new bottle and, and add that on. So Miracle does do a nice job if it's hard to lug a watering can um, or remember to fertilize or you're just super busy that there are products out there. They have one that hooks a, as a, a sprayer too, um, right to the front of your hose. So there are a lot of different products to help with the fertilizing. One thing that we did want to talk a little bit about is we do have customers who oftentimes are very confused about the exposure that plants need in, in your yard. And usually if you're buying perennials, they will have the little tag on them. This one you can see right here at the top, it says it will take part sun to full shade. So evaluating your specific area that you're working on and knowing what your exposure is on a daily basis there is very helpful for us to, to uh, direct you to plants that are correct for that area, but it's also going to make you successful. And unfortunately, just yesterday, I had a customer in who said, well, I bought all those hostas and they're dying. And, and I said, did you tell us you were putting them in the shade? And she said, yes, I did. Are they in the shade? No, they're not. <laughs> so guess what? These hostas start to scorch because they really don't like that uh, hot and our sun is fairly hot and fairly intense, especially in the later afternoon hours. So you want to be certain 
you know, that you're just checking. And, and like I say, they all, almost all these perennials come with a tag on them. It will tell you your exposure right on the front. And if you flip these tags over, it tells you exactly, you know, how cold. This will go down to 30 below. It's a zone 3 plant. Uh, 40 below, I'm sorry. It's drought tolerant. Long and repeat blooming. So, you know, if you know your yard, know your area before you come, we can really help you to find plants that fit that because we we do carry a large selection of shade plants, but also a large selection of very hot sun plants. So there's a spider going over the rose as I'm talking. <laughs> We're going to talk a little bit about roses because I, um, when we started the business, one thing that we discovered quickly is people love roses, but people don't know a lot about them. And so uh, I tried to read everything I could lay my hands on and educate myself and Danae and I really worked hard on, on our rose knowledge, and I think we've really finally gotten a little bit better at it. And uh, do you want to talk about the classifications of sure. roses? So there's quite a few different classifications of roses, and the one that people are probably most familiar with are the tea roses. And those, I think that one's the tea. Is it a tea? Um, the teas are similar to what you get in a, a flower bouquet. They're your long stem roses. Um, they're very showy, they have big blooms, they're usually very fragrant. Unfortunately, they are the least hardy of all the roses. Um, so Easily identified, however, they usually will just put one bloom onto the stem. And that is one good way to know. A lot of times people say, I don't know what I have, if I have a tea rose or what it is. Well, tea roses and grandifloras generally are going to put one, one nice bloom on the top of their... <coughs> The current, the, the current stem that's blooming, yeah. So. And they will generally not be in continual bloom. So they will bloom, they'll be really showy, and then they'll kind of take a little rest, a few weeks cycle, and then they'll, you'll start to see new buds, they'll bloom again, take a rest. So there'll be times where you don't have any color on your tea roses. Um, in town, tea roses generally grow without too much trouble. If you are out on the west side uh, in Valley Falls, um, they are going to take a lot of work and be marginal, whether they will probably winter over depending on the winter. Um, our next class, which is probably my favorite class actually, is the Floribunda. It's hardier and it's going to give you a lot more color consistently. And you'll notice that the buds at the top are in a cluster. So you usually have four to five blooms kind of set um, on a stem. And they open a little bit um, more of like maybe an old-fashioned English rose. Um, they, so they look a little different than your long stem rose, but more continual color and they are a tougher rose. Um, one of the things you can look at on the tags is whether they are an own root rose. So rose companies often graft roses onto a parent plant. Um, trying to find a, a parent plant that's a little tougher. However, if we have a hard winter, it can kill that graft and go back to the wild rose. So if you so can find a rose knows. that says own root, it means that it's going to be true to that plant. I mean, if it dies back, your whole plant is going to die, but you're not going to go back to the wild. And they tend to be the tougher, tougher plants, the own root. One thing that we really recommend on roses in Lakeview is you will see this little bulb right here. This is your, your bud union. This is where all of the magic is occurring in the rose. This is where your graft is. And so if that is left exposed, you're certainly <coughs> leaving yourself open to the possibility of losing one of those parents, like Danae said. So we recommend to our rose customers here that all roses be planted down, to get this bud union underground. It's very important in Lakeview because our winters are fairly harsh. It is not the snow that's going to kill this rose. And it is going to be a dry, cold, uh, below zero exposure that will probably get a rose. So a lot of people think that the snow is what kills the rose. It's not usually the snow. It's usually, the snow is actually our insulation. It's going to be that dry exposure. So anytime you're planting a rose, be sure that you're getting this bud union down underground. It's very important. And in the um, fall, 
you know, after we were kind of past the warmer days and, and roses, or so you could even have a few freezes that have happened. It's really important on um, not so much the shrub rose we'll show you, but the tea, the floribunda, the grandiflora, that you are willing to mulch and protect them. And your mulch can be a lot of different things. We sell a mulch that is a really heavy, nice grade mulch that then you can mix back into your soil in the spring. But I've also used um, like my containers where I have my annuals. I just dump those containers with the old potting soil, um, mix in some leaves. Um, I've used bark mulch before, just anything that's going to come up uh, weighs on that rose and protect it. And I leave that then until probably at least into April before I start to pull that back away from the base of the rose. And the final thing on these grandifloras and the floribundas and the tea roses. In Lakeview, in our area, do not cut these roses back in the fall. Never, ever cut these roses in the fall. You will go to um, possibly Extension or, you know, somewhere else, and they're going to recommend that you trim these roses back. But with our winters, as harsh as they are here, Danae and I have found that it's far more successful to let these canes go ahead and freeze naturally and to not cut on them. Cut on them in the spring when they come back. If you cut them on the, in the fall and then you have another frost that maybe is going to go down another six or eight inches, pretty soon your rose coming out of the ground is about this tall. And you have really compromised that bush's ability to photosynthesize, to, you know, to prosper and go forward. So, you know, our recommendation on roses is to never ever trim on them in the fall. Let them just do their natural, let nature take its course there and freeze them back. And then in the spring, you can make that. And that trim. In rose books, they will say generally the standard is to cut back probably at least a third of the cane in the fall. But for us, like Mom said, if you cut that third back and then you freeze back another half, you know, you're not left with very much margin for error. So if you can leave a lot of pain and just um, let Mother Nature do its thing, you'll be more successful. What exactly is the cane? Those These are the canes. The stems are your canes. That's the, the uh, term that they refer to those. Um, then we have a shrub rose. And the shrub roses, most people can be fairly successful with them. Um, they aren't quite as showy, although there's lots of new varieties they're coming out with. Um, some of you may have seen ones called Home Run or Knockout um, that have a higher petal count, which is just how many petals um, are held. Um, but the shrub rose, much tougher. They're generally on their own root. Uh, they're ones that most people can utilize, and depending on the variety, they'll be in continual bloom or maybe just have one bloom cycle. It just depends a bit on the particular rose. And then we also carry a miniature rose, um, which they just have a little bit smaller blooms, they're a little bit smaller plants, but they still give you a lot of color. They're very, very tough roses. They're on their own root, and they do really well for us here. So if you um, have not had good luck with roses, or maybe just wanting to try out roses, um, a miniature rose is a great one to start with. And they don't take up quite as much garden space either if you are limited on your room. And the last thing I would really talk about really is cutting on these roses. And this one, um, I don't know whether I cut it or Kathy cut it, but these need to be taken down a little bit farther. You need to get these spent blooms off. Um, especially on your tea roses and your grandifloras, they are going to be very reluctant to rebloom if you're not taking off the deadheads. Again, they are a productive plant, and so once you leave that spent bloom, that's really how the how the rose is going to make its uh, reproduction. It's going to go into the into a rose hip probably, and you know then that cane is kind of non-productive at that point. It's done its thing. So you need to be sure that you're taking off those spent blooms, getting them back to a good leaf junction is what I call it. You know, there's a lot of various theories on cutting these. Um, after they've bloomed, a lot of people say you've got to take them back to a leaf with to a stem that has five leaves. I don't. I just take mine back to where you have a really good junction and make sure that, you know, you've really, this one needs a little bit more trimming done on it, but even on these little shrub roses and on your miniatures, 
you want to take off those spent blooms because a lot of plant energy goes into bloom. And once it's done, you should take that away. On a separate note, if you have a rose bush that is struggling, I really um, recommend to people to take off the bloom session. And the power goes to the root, and your plant usually will do better. But if you have really any plant that is struggling, but particularly roses, take away their bloom session, and it makes the power go to the root, and it really will help your bush. Can you uh, cut the canes and restart? Like start a root off the canes? Like you do a draining or something? It's uh, highly against the law for us, but yeah. okay. um, we, you know, we cannot, they're we can't all, ever do anything mm -hmm. like that <coughs> because they're patented roses, so we can't do that. But you maybe would have some success at home, but, you know, the thing of it is, is that, I don't know how you feel about it, but it's very difficult on these because they are already, they've already had a, a bud union down there, so sometimes when you restart them, you don't get the same thing that's coming off of here. If you have maybe, uh, I would say you're probably going to need a greenhouse or something to extend your season because I don't know with our growing season that you would have a long enough time to really get one established. If you live somewhere much more milder, you might have a better luck. It's, we were very reluctant at the beginning to bring in bare root roses and went with the potted roses just because our season is so short that to get those roots really established. So if you had a greenhouse where maybe you could put in a container and try to get it going and get a little bit more roots, you might might potentially have luck. I have to say I'm not really scientific enough to know much about grafting and and really getting that to, to go very well. I just just partly I just have never studied about it because we can't do it, so unless you don't want us to be here anymore. We won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I mean, kind of an interesting side note, we do have a lot of people that come in asking for seeds for like the Million Bells and Super Tunias, and they don't manufacture them um, because they are um, a patented variety that is sterile. So all of their plants, they grow from cuttings. So And it's very, very highly controlled. <coughs> and we cannot ever propagate or do anything of that nature with especially any of these patented varieties, uh, proven winners, you know, we pretty much consent our life and love to them that we will not ever uh, propagate anything from them. So so that is, so a lot of people do come in looking for seeds and that's really why we, we don't have them because they do propagate by cuttings and it's very controlled. They have strict regulations on how we can even Room and what size of containers and things like that. So. And you know, a lot of times you will go to stores and you will, this is one thing, uh, you will notice that we pretty much always grow in a black container, just a square black container, because if we buy their branded containers, we cannot vary to any other varieties. And so we carry, you know, other, other branded uh, varieties such as Duman. You will see some of our tags say Duman on them. Uh, and other places, and it's very highly restricted. We cannot put something from Duman in something from Proven, you know, in a Proven Winter pot. We can get in big trouble for that. So mm -hmm. it's something you have to really be cautious of when you're mm -hmm. growing. And so for you as a consumer, you should feel, you know, confident when you go into a store and you you do buy something in a branded container, you, you know that it really is truly a Proven Winter's product because you know, that is your assurance, that branded container is your assurance. We just can't really, where we, we try to carry as wide a variety as we can, so we don't really bring the branded containers, but it's something that, as a consumer, it's kind of nice to know. Um, some other things uh, that we brought to show you, we have a new clematis grower this year that we've been really happy with. They're another small, smallish family farm. We like to, if our wholesalers can also be family farms, that's nice and so um, we were really happy to find this um, farm and um, have been really happy with the products um, and we looked far and wide for a very good clematis grower and they're surprisingly although Oregon has the largest number they're hard to find that will wholesale to a small place like us so um, clematis even though they look um, fairly fragile 
Um, they are a really good buying for us, but there are some things you have to keep in mind growing them. They like the, the plant, likes the hot sun um, or a good amount of sun, more than six hours. The base likes to be a bit more shaded and cooler. So it works really well if you can maybe plant some smaller, shorter plants around the base or maybe even some rocks, something to kind of protect the root um, and then have the rest of the plant be available to sun. And a very, very cool thing to do if you're into this kind of gardening is to buy a clematis and a climbing rose and dig your hole a little bit bigger and throw them in there together. And the coolest thing occurs because those beautiful climbing roses get tangled up with that clematis and it's just a very showy explosion of, um, of beauty, I think. Um, so that's kind of nice to do. And then uh, we carry a wide range of shrubs. Um, besides the roses and one of the ones and it's actually an approval winners container mm. approval winners is um hydrangea so most people do not realize you can grow hydrangeas here in lakeview and we are more limited the big showy mop head hydrangeas like you'll see in corvallis or the other places in the lamb valley they're going to be kind of iffy for here but these are called a panicle hydrangea their bloom is more of a cone shape and they are much tougher. So there's two. This is the limelight, and you get the uh, kind of greenish lime color. And then the other one is a pinky winky that we carry, and it starts out um, cream color and fades to darker shades of pink. Mm -hmm. And we have tested these quite a bit in our own yards. Mom has several in Valley Falls, and um, she doesn't winterize like I do. <coughs> I'm terrible, just so you all know. If it grows at my house, it'll grow at your house because I don't do this. I look through like a pallet of mulch, making sure everything's nice and put to bed. And mom just it, it has to make it. It's going to do it on its own. And she has several of these hydrangeas that have done really well. So my um, pinky winky is probably about this tall right now and a pretty expansive bush. Although, I will say one thing about these hydrangeas, you kind of get used to the fact that their their stems are pretty airy and open, but mine is really tangled up with a, a an old rose that I had there, and they've kind of all gotten mixed together, and it's really very, very pretty. But, um, you know, they're late bloomers. This one is a little bit earlier because it's new this year, and, uh, of course, it's kind of on the Willamette Valley schedule right now, but. For us, mine usually blooms about mid-July, and it carries through into later August. Uh, probably about a six-week bloom session on them. And uh, and like Denise says, on the panicle, more like a, kind of like a lilac in a way, kind of a long, elongated bloom. Um, and same things with the hydrangeas. Um, you know, you don't want to trim them back in the winter. Um, you want to let them naturally die back. Um, and if I, I would mulch, but you can get away without mulching. Um, on any of the shrubs and trees and perennials, one of the main things that people have trouble with the first year is water. So even if, um, like the daylily here says drought tolerant, that first year, maybe even first couple of years, they still have a high water requirement to get their roots going down into the ground until they can access some of the natural water available to them. So that first year, you really want to be watering daily. Um, we carry all containerized um, shrubs and trees, so you can plant really any time from when the ground um, is not frozen in the spring to when it freezes in the fall. But the main trick is you have to have daily water. And you don't want to have like a drip system. You want to have deep watering to promote those roots going down instead of spreading out. A lot of people, this is a common issue we have, people will come to us and say, well, you know, I bought that from you last year and it didn't do well, and I, I'll say, well, you know, what kind of water did you have? And they'll say, well, it was getting hit by my sprinkler that was going around there, and I'm like, you know what, that just is not enough. You, you cannot expect these, uh, especially these plants with a really good root system, to survive on a on a very sparse water, although it seems like your grass is very adequately watered, you know what happens to these shrubs is their roots will start to grow horizontally, and you're so now instead of getting down deep where they're protected by Mother Earth, 
Now their root system is kind of laying out here right underneath the soil and that's kind of where you start to lose plants and where you don't have a good winter over because those roots are very um, horizontal and closer to the surface. You definitely want to do deep watering on the shrubs and trees but um, other than doing it right in the heat of the day you can plant these things through the course of our, our season so a lot of people are used to just you know early spring late fall planting but with the containerized um, shrubs and trees you really have a much longer window to get things in to the ground and here a lot of people have been used to you know labor day hits and they're kind of done planting but um, we do bring in mums and ornamental grasses and pansies to really extend the season um, we do pumpkin planters and so you can enjoy flowers and color clear to november really mm -hmm. What about using wood chips around for mulching? Could that hold it? Yeah, yeah that would definitely help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can get very creative with what you use for your mulches. And although Denise says I don't mulch, I have a lot of trees in my yard and I figure the leaves are kind of the mulch, so there. <laughs> I do see you use like a tomato cage. Um, you know, if it will fit around what you're trying to protect, they'll use a tomato cage or they'll take some woven wire and then they will put leaves in the base to kind of hold it there. So that is another way to mulch. I avoid using, the one thing I do avoid using really much of is grass clippings because they tend to decompose and rot and you get a lot of moisture. So, and if you do use a lot of leaves, those kind of need taken out maybe a little earlier because of the, the rot factor. Yeah. yeah. Um, would you define the deep watering? How long? Oh, well, in the heat, when we really get into the hot weather, really it needs to be daily. I feel like, especially on a tree, if you're setting down a new tree, you've really got to water on that daily. You know, sometimes you're going to just have to look at the plant and say, oh, the ground is still fairly moist around here, I can wait. But really, on any of these, I don't recommend going more than every other day. And watering is a trick, and it's very hard to, to tell somebody exactly what the right amount of water is, because more plants die from being overloved than from underloved, to be completely honest. Especially your annuals. Um, yeah. you know, drainage for the annuals is really important. You don't want them to sit in standing water. But I try to think on my shrubs and trees, like how long is it taking for the water when I'm watering at the nursery to get from the top till I see it go out the holes in the bottom. So it might be a couple minutes. Um, it could be quicker than that if it's holding the moisture longer, but you know, you're wanting probably at least a couple gallons of water to run onto that. So you could try um, maybe seeing how long it takes maybe to fill up even like a gallon watering can and, and okay. seeing what your time is on that. And that might help you know that you're getting enough. Okay. But then, you know, seeing if your tree is wilting too and telling, well, maybe it needs a little bit more got to really watch and, and see what your leaf response is. You know, these are, I mean, obviously all today they've all been watered and we might have to vacuum before we leave, but you can see that the leaves are really holding nicely and, you know, there's no wilt there. So, you know, it's, it is definitely, I think, an evaluation process, you know, knowing your soil. Some people have a very high clay content. That soil is difficult. It doesn't drain really well and sometimes plants do not like that very, you know, sticky clay soil. You've got to kind of know what you're growing in. And, and I do recommend to people, if you do have that very sticky clay thick soil, to uh, once you've uh, prepared a hole or dug your hole, to use, to use a, another medium to replace with. Don't put that heavy clay back in there. If you have really heavy clay, I do recommend that you put a little layer of rocks down in the bottom of that hole. It's just like a container. You're going to kind of make a little drainage bed in there. So, you know, then you might replace with some compost. We have some bagged compost, something else, and putting, you know, don't put that clay back in there if you don't have to. And there are a lot of products too to help. Um, we have some starter packs that I didn't bring that help kind of with the shock that you just throw right in the hole with your um, shrub or tree. And then um, Bear, it's one of our favorite fruit chemical products, but um, a lot of people use the Bear and Shrub. It's like the rose, <coughs> it gives fertilizer and then some insect and disease protection generally once or twice a season. 
um, is adequate. Some people, just depending on where they're at, we have some people in Paisley that have a lot of trouble with boars, and they'll notice the little sawdust holes coming out of their trees, and, and so depending on what your insect problem may be, you may have to use it a little bit more, but it's a really a great product um, for trees and shrubs. Now we'll talk about the question that everybody wants to know about, the pesty pests is what I call them. And uh, there's quite a few around Lakeview. Let's start with public enemy number one, and that's the deer. Um, we do have a very large population of deer inside the city limits, and they are extremely destructive. And they're very, uh, they're very unobserving. They will eat just about anything. We do carry, you know, a lot of plants that are deer resistant. That being said, nothing is deer proof. So, things if you are having trouble with deer, um, you know, things that have a very strong fragrance, so herbs, lavenders, sages, they, they don't like anything that's going to mess with their fight or flight sense. So that's something they will be less likely to eat. Um, thick, fuzzy leaves, they tend to want to uh, stay away from. But if you're like me, and I am not willing to be limited by what the deer won't eat, because I love roses, which they also love, uh, there are some sprays, you have to be fairly diligent about using them, but there are some different products that definitely help with them. We also have a little emitter that you can put in the ground. Uh, we have some granular product that uh, you can sprinkle on the ground around your plants, and then um, we don't carry this product ourselves, but I do know that they do have it at the True Value. It's called Squirt em, Don't Hurt Them, and it is a sensor, uh, kind of a motion sensor sprinkler that if the deer come into your yard, it immediately comes on and they don't like that. They don't like getting sprayed. So, you know, there, there are some things to do. There are some ways we can help you. None of it is, I suppose, really easy or without maintenance, but, you know, if you are an avid gardener and if you love to garden, you're willing to just about try anything. Um, trees, one thing, uh, the, just even within the last couple of years, we've had more people complaining about deer rubbing their antlers on new trees. So we really recommend if you're making that investment into a tree that you cage it or we have wraps that you can use, vinyl wraps, um, to protect that trunk because they, the tree will not always snap out of that. Kind of uh, once you break the bark on a new tree, it's kind of like having your skin ripped off. And that's the protection for the tree. It lets everything in from bugs to disease to the frost. And really, your tree is probably fairly well compromised at that point. Um, one thing that, Danae and I'd like to talk a little bit about is thrips because it's not something that people are very knowledgeable, knowledgeable about in our area, yet it is a pest that is extremely destructive and it's becoming more and more prevalent. We have a very high concentration of thrips around our area because the one thing that they love very much is alfalfa. And they love to start on any kind of weed structure, but they uh, also really love alfalfa. And so as the heat comes on and it, and it gets hotter and hotter, the thrips become prevalent. And you probably have not seen them and you don't know what they look like, and they are very, very hard to see. But you will see thrip damage on a leaf. Your leaf may become kind of mottled in appearance. It looks like, it doesn't really look to you like, hmm, nothing's really that wrong here. But really, the thrip damage is occurring, and they're microscopic. Um, their mode of operation is to get in on those leaves, and they will just begin to eradicate your plant by sucking the life right out of them. And uh, we do carry some products. They are very, very difficult to get. To kill. But this uh, is one thing that we do carry is the Captain Jack. And I want to say uh, the spinosad that you see right here advertised on the outside of the bottle is the effective ingredient on the thrips. So although this product is a good one, there are other products out there as well. But if you are seeing thrip damage, you want to be looking for a product that has the spinosad in it. And like I say, you really won't see the thrips. You will just see their damage. So are we getting to where okay. We're almost done, everybody. Um, you know, other common pests here in the view, the biggest one we get all summer long is earwigs. 
that people have trouble with. Earwigs especially like plants like the dahlias. Um, you know, and they will just overnight pretty much consume almost your entire plant. So if you're looking, if you're seeing big chunks out of your plant, you're probably having um, earwigs. They'll kind of leave a little skeleton of your leaf. Um, you could have grasshoppers, you could have slugs, but earwigs definitely are one of the main ones. They come out at night, they live down in the soil. There's a wide range of products. You can use um, different granules, um, diatomaceous earth, but you can also try some home remedies. Um, you can take a little cup, probably about that deep, you know, an inch or so, and fill it with like soy sauce and vegetable oil. Half and half. Mm -hmm. Place it around uh, where you're having the earwig damage, and the next morning you'll come out and it'll be filled up with earwigs, which is really gross, but it is effective. Mm -hmm. um, if you have dogs or cats, they love to get into it. We do have some traps that are made. It's the same concept, only it has a little lid with little holes in it, so if you have dogs, they won't get into it. Um, but if you don't have that problem with dogs, you can just use, you know, like an empty tuna can or butter dish. Um, aphids are of course a common one and white flies often come with aphids or little itty bitty white specks that you will see um, also around usually the, the blooms. Um, you can use soap, soapy water, that's kind of the standard home remedy or um, some of the different chemical products as well. And then we do have slugs here, a lot of people think they are Willamette Valley problems but we do have slugs and they particularly like plants like hostas. Um, again, there's of course chemicals you can buy, but you can also use um, things like cat litter. They don't like the sharp edges of like a cat litter or a gravel um, or little cans with beer also. They'll go into and drink. They seem to really enjoy beer. <laughs> and they're not particular on the kind, so. Um, and we just wanted to kind of finish by saying there's, you know, um, some type of gardening for everyone. So if you live in a little apartment and you don't have much space, we do have um, fairy gardens are popular and there's little pieces you can put in with your little plants and they do them just tiny and buckets. Um, so container gardening to, you know, our larger landscaping. Thank you so much for letting us come. And can we use that uh, Dr. Earth fertilizer in Vegetable gardens too? There is yeah. one for vegetables as well. There's an all-purpose. So, you know, you, if you have flowers and vegetables and you want to just buy one bag, there's an all-purpose. And then my sister has had great luck in her vegetables with, it's a vegetable herb, Dr. Herb. And there's also one that's more specific for fruit trees also. And it's not too late to start your gardens. Yeah, not too late to start your gardens. <laughs> I haven't done mine yet. I haven't so. done my vegetables either yet. The veggies like the soil very, very warm, and so, you know, we're just now getting into that. If you're buying starts, like, you know, we have a lot of starts at the nursery. If you're buying starts, you're certainly not too late. And some things come up very quick. Um, your zucchini, your cucumbers, they're very quick. And we do have starts for those as well. And, mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, I do recommend to people, uh, especially on peas and beans, that you soak them. Soak them overnight, and you will have a much quicker uh, germination, and they'll they'll sprout much faster. Break down that shell a little bit. And there are some vegetables you can even start another crop in the cooler season in the fall, like your lettuce and spinach. They really don't like the really intense heat we'll have here in July and August, so you can get another crop of them in the fall when it gets cooler. Mm -hmm. So happy gardening, everybody. <laughs> well, we just really want to thank Tammy and Danae for coming. I'd like to thank Rizinski from the Examiner for filming. I'd like to thank our board members that are present here today, Rob Nichols and Grant uh, Wishart. And also to thank the Senior Center for hosting uh, our, our luncheon here today, providing the, the lovely meal that we were able to purchase while we enjoyed this event. So thank you all for coming, and stay tuned for next month.